the previous episode, we explored the shady story behind the American nationalized corporation known as Militech, a company that dedicated itself to creating some of the best military hardware the world had ever seen, as well as creating their own private army capable of doing any task necessary, regardless of how ethical it really was. Throughout their years within the 21st century, Militech would find themselves within fierce competition with a similar corporation based out within the East. This corporation would also develop their own weaponry and military hardware and had one of the largest forces capable of taking over a single country in a manner of days if they so wished. This corporation would be known as Arasaka, run by their CEO and Emperor Saburu Arasaka. With tension between the two corporations rising year in year out, their ambitions would trigger multiple events that would shape the whole landscape of the world and would continue to set up multiple situations going into the latter half of the 21st century. So how did Arasaka come about? What were their ultimate ambitions? What happened to them over the years and what does their future look like now? Well in today's episode written once again by the amazing Mrs. Wisefish, we will be exploring everything about the Arasaka Corporation and their dodgy dealings and answering all those questions above. And if you do enjoy what you see at any point in this video, please do leave a like, nice comment and subscribe if you haven't already. And with that said, this is the story behind the mega corporation from Tokyo, Japan. This is the dark history behind Arasaka Corporation. of Arasaka begins with Sasai Arasaka born in Tokyo, Japan in 1859. His career began when he joined the Japanese Imperial Army where he rose through the ranks to become a captain. After his retirement from the army, Sasai entered the world of business, at first as a worker and then becoming a successful businessman in his own right. During this time, Sasai met and married his wife Yui and began construction of Arasaka family compound. The compound was built in the style of a traditional Japanese fortress, perhaps indicating the focus of Sasai's future career. He wanted the compound to be a safe haven for the family he wanted to build with Yui and had made many escape routes and ways for the family to defend themselves. Shortly after completing the Arasaka family compound, Sasai set up the Arasaka Corporation in 1915. The the purpose of the corporation was weapons manufacturing which played to Sasai's strengths and previous experience of being in the Japanese Imperial Army, his business prowess and his focus on safety for his family as well. The business grew steadily and Sasai's success was enhanced when Yui gave birth to their son Saburu in 1919. The fortunes of the Arasaka family and corporation were really set to boom when the Second World War broke out. Sasai capitalized on Japan's involvement and started to supply the Japanese Imperial Navy with ships and planes. This had extra importance to Sasai as his son Saburu, now in his 20s, had enlisted as a pilot in the Japanese Imperial Navy. Saburu, like his father, quickly rose through the ranks, becoming a lieutenant at just the age of 23. However, Saburu would find World War II a far more intense experience. In the year following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese Navy had been gradually taking Allied territories in the South Pacific. Pacific. They had captured the Philippines from the Americans, British Malaya from the British, and the East Indies from the Dutch. This was all part of the plan to isolate Australia and New Zealand from the other Allied forces. In May 1942, Japan had captured Guadalcanal on the Solomon Islands, a place where they could actually attack Australia from. The Americans, as retaliation and despite being heavily underprepared, launched Operation Watchtower, the first Allied land offensive of the Second World War. The Japanese Japanese were taken thoroughly by surprise when America conducted its first ever amphibious landing in Guadalcanal. A short battle ensued, but the Americans successfully expelled the Japanese from Guadalcanal, saving Australia for the time being. Americans now had to hold Guadalcanal whilst completely surrounded by Japanese bases across the South Pacific. Saburu was stationed at one of those bases, the former Australian territory of Rabaul in Papua New Guinea. Later in 1942, Saburu 
Kuro was given a mission to be part of a flying escort in his A6M0 of the GM4 Betty bombers. The aim was to successfully get the bombers to Guadalcanal where they could attack the American forces stationed there. But first they would have to navigate the South Pacific Ocean where they would be completely out in the open and vulnerable to attack from the Americans. As the Japanese had feared the Americans were soon pursuing them across the Pacific and Saburo's escort was attacked by a group of Grumman F4Fs. The Zero pilots broke formation in an order to retaliate against the Americans. Saburo was able to take down one Grumman but whilst in pursuit of another he crossed enemy lines taking heavy fire to his plane. The bullets smashed through the metal and perspex of his cockpit, shattering his left arm and sending shards of the plane into his face and eye. With Saburo rapidly losing consciousness due to his injuries, his plane began to nosedive the 15,000 feet to the ocean below. With just 2,000 feet to spare, Saburo regained enough consciousness to correct his plane. He had no choice with his severe injuries to attempt the 560 mile flight back to his base at Rabul, unsure that he would even make it. Saburo did make it back to Rabul and managed to report to his commander before collapsing. And with that, he was immediately transported back to Tokyo for medical treatment. When he finally regained consciousness, he was told of the extent of his injuries. His left arm had been saved, but he would never be able to use it ever again. He would have scars on his face for the rest of his life, and the damage to his left eye had left him partially blind. Saburo was told that he would never be able to fly ever again. For him, this was the ultimate failure. He felt it was dishonorable to have been medically discharged rather than have had her hero's ending and fallen in battle fighting for his country. For the rest of the war, he languished at the Arasaka family compound, ashamed of how his military career had ended. In 1945, the war ended with Japan's surrender to the Allied forces, spelling trouble both for Sasai and for Saburo. Japan's economy suffered as a result of the war ending, which would spell the end for many Japanese businesses. However, Sasai had foreseen that defeat was a possibility, so throughout the war he had been stowing his assets away overseas, which allowed his family and the Arasaka Corporation to just stay afloat after the war. Saburo, however, was devastated by his country's loss and felt there was no way he could continue in a world where Japan would not be the victor. Saburo was about to act on his despair when suddenly he was struck with an epiphany. In this epiphany, he foresaw the future and potential of the Arasaka Corporation and all that he could achieve with the company when he inherited it from his father. And not just that, how he could use his position within the Arasaka Corporation to enable his beloved Japan to return to its former glory and even rise as greater power globally than ever before. Saburo in that moment put aside the tragedy of Japan's loss and his own injuries and resolved to throw himself into becoming an effective businessman. He began by enrolling in Todai, the Imperial University of Tokyo, and studying business, politics, economics, and history. His plan was to steer the Arasaka Corporation into becoming the dominant business over all of its competition. In 1960, Sasai passed away, leaving Saburo at the age of 41 to inherit and become CEO of the Arasaka Corporation. Saburo quickly got to work enacting his vision of corporate domination by diversifying the Arasaka Corporation's reach, starting with the opening of the Arasaka Bank. Saburo predicted that Japan's economy would start to grow and wanted to be ready to capitalize on the recovery. Using the amassed fortune that his father Sasai had protected and continued to grow, over the years, Saburo had a decent capital base in which he started up his bank that would focus on corporate and business accounts. Starting small, Saburo built up the bank's capital by cleverly investing and lending to businesses that he predicted would be headed for growth in this new economically viable era for Japan. In 1970, after acquiring an extreme amount of wealth for the Arasaka Corporation, Saburo was ready to expand the family business even further by starting up his third venture. 
Arasaka Security. Arasaka Security had two main functions. First, to provide manpower for both corporate and personal protection, and secondly, to provide and manufacture technology for the purposes of electronic and computer security. Arasaka Security was a huge global success. Saburo had focused on creating a service of real quality. The security personnel received the best training and were the best equipped on the market, being skilled in the latest security procedures and able to hand any form of combat both armed and unarmed. They were also fully trained in how to handle a variety of equipment to suit Arasaka's clients' needs. Saburo knew that having such an elite and sophisticated security service would allow him to command a very high price for the loaning of such operatives. By making the service fully bespoke, Saburo allowed for a variety of people and businesses to be able to afford first-class security, maximizing the earning potential for the Arasaka Corporation. Saburo had successfully established and maintained what he called the three pillars of the Arasaka Corporation, Arasaka Manufacturing, the Arasaka Bank, and Arasaka Security. But while Saburo was expanding publicly on his father's legacy, behind the scenes he was resorting to different tactics to further the power of the Arasaka Corporation. Saburo had no problem with bribing people and finding out ways of blackmailing and extorting important figures in politics and business, even sometimes resorting to abduction and assassination in order to glean information and further his influence over people. Saburo was also using his newly founded Arasaka Security to collect secret information on his clients using spyware built into the security software he had been selling to other corporations. Saburo had no intention of selling the information he collected, rather he used the information to predict business and economic trends, allowing him to get ahead of his competition and make clever business decisions and make a profit that way instead. This information also allowed him to exploit people using his new bank as well, by knowing when his clients would desperately need a loan and being there with high interest at just the right time. Saburo was also using the bank as a front for money laundering between the Arasaka Corporation and the smaller businesses he had been gradually buying out. The corporation at this point in time was going from strength to strength. There was only one more thing that Saburo needed to solidify the growing power of the Arasaka name, an heir. And in 1980, his legacy was secured with the birth of his son, Kei. Saburo had the specific intention that Kei would one day become the CEO of the Arasaka Corporation, just as he himself had inherited this responsibility from his father. Saburo wasted no time in grooming and preparing Kei to be an effective business leader worthy of all that Saburo had achieved so far. After Saburo's wife's death, he met the beautiful and sophisticated Michiko in Kyoto. Michiko came from a wealthy family and had the distinction of having attended one of the most elite universities in all of Japan. Like Saburo, she wanted to see Japan prosper again after the losses caused by the war. Michiko didn't really know much about the Arasaka Corporation, but she fell in love with what she perceived as Saburo's noble nature and they married within a year of meeting each other. The Arasaka Corporation was going from strength to strength still, with Saburo being rewarded for his work by appearing on the Global 500 list for the first time in the early 1990s. But in 1994 was when Arasaka had to survive its first real test. In the preceding years, the Gang of Four, an American political cabal made up of the NSA, FBI, CIA and DEA, was growing discontented with the European economic community moving away from American influence. This EEC was doing increasingly anti-USA things, like sending aid to the Soviet Union, leading to the USSR accepting the EEC's currency of the Euro dollar over the US dollar, and making peace with Europe for the first time in 40 years. A consequence of this was the collapse of NATO, further diminishing the US's power and influence. The EEC was also expanding its space program which worried the US that the EEC was not just the largest economic power but could also become the world's greatest military power as well. The NSA convinced the Gang of Four that something had to be done to protect the US's status on the world stage and so they resorted to undermining the structure of the EEC. The Gang of Four started hacking into the stock market 
markets of Europe and Asia and skewing the figures to make the US look far more wealthy than it actually was. This plan, however, massively backfires. When the EEC discovered what the US and the Gang of Four was up to, they revealed all to the press. This caused an extreme lack of faith in the exchange rate between the Euro dollar and the US dollar. People panicked and the global stock market crashed in 1994. This dispelled disaster for corporations around the world, but Saburo had been sneakily keeping an eye on the EEC and the Gang of Four for years, knowing exactly what was going on and using his superior business knowledge, was able to predict the crash and prepare the Arasaka Corporation to not just survive the crash, but actually profit from it. He also predicted the fallout for the US in 1996, after the EEC and the rest of the world put out an embargo on any trade with the US, effectively making the US a pariah state as Saburo took full advantage of this void in the global market. The Arasaka Corporation began buying up the businesses that had fallen victim to the crash that could be valuable assets and destroying any competition that the Arasaka Corporation had left. The security branch of the Arasaka Corporation was also expanding by building up an actual private army that was training in the forbidden waste of Hokkaido Island. Now a corporation, person or country could hire their own personalized paramilitaries for any warfare they wanted. Saburo now wanted to enact the next part of his vision from 1945, that of a truly powerful and glorious Japan. Saburo started his plan by using all of his illegally acquired knowledge to control around 60% of all Japanese politicians. However, despite his intentions to help Japan, other Japanese businesses and corporations had become tired of Saburo's never-ending ambition and how it was impacting them and Japanese people's freedom. The other businesses banded together to form the Far Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere, or FACS for short. Saburo for once was not able to ride this setback out, and the FACS successfully undermined his political control, leading to the arrest of many Japanese politicians. This didn't stop Saburo's quest for ultimate power at all. Instead, he turned his attention to the Japanese police force, completely undermining its power by creating the Arasaka Police, another sub-branch of Arasaka security alongside the Arasaka Army. Tokyo was the only city that managed to resist being taken over by the Arasaka Corporation completely. Despite one setback with his political ambitions, by the end of the 1990s, Saburo was number two on the Global 500 list. It seemed like Saburo and the Arasaka Corporation had become untouchable. And while Saburo was building up his empire, his family with his wife Michiko was growing too. Michiko gave birth to a son, Yoronobu, in 1995, and later in 1999, she gave birth to a daughter. Hanako. Sadly though, Michiko would not see her children grow up as she died as a result of complications during childbirth shortly after Hanako was born. Hanako therefore became Saburo's favorite child. Whilst he expected his sons to follow him in business and go out into the world, Saburo kept Hanako safely educated at home at the Arasaka family compound. Now approaching 20, Saburo's oldest son Kei had taken an interest in martial arts and had started training at the Hokkaido facility. Saburo was fine with his son having interests outside of business until Kei started prioritizing his training over his studies, causing an angry Saburo to force Kei to stop his training at Hokkaido and focus only on preparing to run the Arasaka Corporation. By the year 2000, Saburo was now 85 years young, but his age had become of little consequence to his ability to keep the Arasaka Corporation at the top of its game. He had used cybernetics to replace his damaged eye and arm that he had injured during the war. These cybernetics also slowed Saburo's aging, meaning that despite his political setbacks, he was fully prepared to take Arasaka Corporation into the 21st century. At this point in time, the Arasaka army was being hired out to governments across the world, such as Slovakia, Hong Kong, and also Taiwan, who needed assistance against China, who had hired their own army from Arasaka's main power rival, Militech. In 2013, Saburo decided it was time to expand into what was left of the United States, choosing Night City 
as the place for a new Arasaka American headquarters. Whilst overseeing the new headquarters, Saburo heard of an employee at a rival corporation called ITS who was known as Alt Cunningham. Alt was a specialist in artificial intelligence and had developed a program that could transfer the consciousness and personality of a person into a digital form called an engram. ITS had decided to further capitalize on this new technology by getting Alt to develop what they called the Soul Killer. The Soul Killer took the idea of transferring a person's consciousness and changed it into forcibly trapping a consciousness, causing instant death of the intended target. Saburo knew that he had to have this technology to keep ahead of the competition, so he arranged for Alt to be kidnapped when she was leaving a concert with her boyfriend Johnny Silverhand. Alt was forced to replicate the Soul Killer under the direction of Toshiro Harade, the Arasaka American CEO. Meanwhile, Johnny Silverhand had incited a riot outside the newly built Arasaka Tower and later was able to storm the building. Harade knew his time was up and decided to make Alt the Soul Killer 2.0's first victim. Alt, however, was able to fend off the attack, taking out Harade's bodyguard and the Netrunner team. And when Johnny sent off the bomb in the tower, Harade seized his opportunity and prepared to separate Alt's consciousness from her body. Harade was almost successful before Johnny burst in and killed him. He found Alt hooked up to the Soul Killer 2.0 and disconnected her. However, he didn't realize that by disconnecting her, he had completed what Harade had started. Alt was killed instantly, but her consciousness was forever trapped as an engram. Saburo, however, had got exactly what he wanted, a rival soul killer, regardless of the cost. With Toshiro Harade dead, Saburo appointed his eldest son Kei as the new American CEO of Arasaka. And with Yorinobu having just graduated from Saburo's alma mater Todai, Saburo felt it was time to bring him into the inner circle of the Arasaka Corporation. Saburo told Yorinobu the whole truth about how he ran Arasaka and what his vision of the future for both the corporation and for Japan was. Yorinobu, however, did not share his father's vision for the future and wanted nothing to do with Arasaka's future. He decided though to stay silent, letting his father believe that he was fully on board with him and Kei. Yorinobu left the family that same night with a plan to bring down his father and the Arasaka Corporation. After leaving that night, Yorinobu sought out a tough group of Tokyo nomads called the Bozozuku, or the Still Dragons, whose purpose was to bring down what they saw as the corrupt Arasaka Corporation. Yorinobu was able to provide the Steel Dragons with valuable insider information while still masquerading as a loyal member of the Arasaka family. His work for the corporation also allowed him to travel the world and meet other people who also wanted to see the downfall of the Arasaka Corporation. After a few months of this deception, Saburo discovered what his son had been up to behind his back. Saburo was devastated at this betrayal but knew that he had to deal with Yorinobu to protect the corporation. Kei had no such sorrow and vowed to outright kill his younger brother for his betrayal. Yorinobu went into hiding with the Steel Dragons and despite Saburo wishing to protect his daughter Hanako, a bond was so strong with her brother that she would keep in contact with him once a month through the net. Following this betrayal, Saburo decided it was time for him to step down as CEO and hand the reins to Kei. However, Kei was CEO in name only, with Saburo still pulling the strings from the Arasaka family compound. Whilst Kay shared his father's vision, he had a different outlook as to how the Arasaka Corporation should be run. Whilst Yorinobu's betrayal had highlighted that Saburo was emotionally invested in his company, Kay would run Arasaka with a more detached stance. He believed that this was the only way to be an effective decision maker in business and rarely showed any emotion. Kay also had gotten married, but this was not straightforward. Despite his wife being of Japanese descent, she was by birth an American, which Kay knew his father would disprove of when their daughter was born, also called Michiko, just to confuse us all. Kei decided to keep their existence a secret from not just his father, but everyone he knew in order to keep them safe. Meanwhile, trouble was brewing that would really put Kei's new leadership of the Arasaka Corporation to the ultimate test. The German Nautical Technology and Shipping Corporation, IHAG, had filed for bankruptcy in 2021. The assets and market share that IHAG 
had had were incredibly significant for their rivals, particularly the French Oceanographic and Shipbuilding Corporation, CINO. Both CINO and OTEC were so similarly matched in funds that neither could outbid the other for the rights to IHAG's assets. This in turn led to CINO and OTEC having to resort to other methods to get the better of the other. CINO decided to hire paramilitaries from the Arasaka Corporation Army, whereas OTEC hired Arasaka's main industry rivals, Militech. K was philosophical about this conflict, as it could be a great opportunity for Arasaka to deplete Militech's resources, thus ridding themselves of another rival corporation. Militech immediately went on the offensive by trying to recruit Yoronobu to their side for all of his inner knowledge of the Arasaka Corporation. Yoronobu refused, instead deciding to take his information to the Japanese government. This allowed the Japanese government to nationalize some of Arasaka's assets. Despite not having Yoronobu on side, Militech did manage to recruit Johnny Silverhand, whose hatred of Arasaka for what they had done to Alt Cunningham had not been dampened. Therefore, Militech knew that Arasaka had the advantage with the updated Soul Killer technology. They also learned that Alt's consciousness still existed and was being kept as an engram in the Arasaka Corporation's American headquarters in Night City. Both Alt and the Soul Killer were kept in Kay's apartment on the 120th floor of the Arasaka Tower in a bunker and heavily guarded. Johnny Silverhand, along with Morgan Blackhand, concocted a plan in order to rescue Alt's consciousness and destroy the Soul Killer codes, with the idea of incapacitating Arasaka and eliminating their advantage. Silverhand and Blackhand decided the best way to get into Arasaka Tower was dropping their teams on the roof and going down to the labs instead of up. When they reached the labs, Alt's consciousness was downloaded into a data suitcase and a virus was uploaded into the Arasaka network to destroy all of the knowledge of Soul Killer. They were not alone for long, however, as Arasaka responded robustly with their paramilitaries, engaging the Militech agents in armed combat. Most of Silverhand's team got away except for Silverhand himself, but as Arasaka continued to deal with the other Militech spec ops, disaster struck. Somehow, a 0.1 to 0.5 load nuclear bomb was detonated in the office of Kei Arasaka. The Arasaka headquarters and everyone inside them were completely obliterated and the blast destroying the surrounding area claimed the lives of 12,000 people instantly. The blast was 366 meters above sea level, meaning it was technically an air detonation, but it was still powerful enough to cause an earthquake, which triggered a flood and then with so much debris, a firestorm was ignited in Night City and the surrounding areas, destroying even more infrastructure. As a result of the radioactivity and destruction the blast caused, another quarter of a million people had died within just a few months. Militech were quick to blame the Arasaka Corporation for the nuclear blast, saying that they purposefully destroyed their own headquarters and the data housed within it to prevent their information getting into their rival Militech's hands. The then US President Elizabeth Kress believed Militech, despite it not being determinable who exactly set the nuke. President Kress made a point of humiliating the Arasaka Corporation, revoking their right to operate in America and branding their members terrorists, forcing them to flee. The Japanese government were also humiliated by one of their own companies being assumed to have done such a terrible thing and in order to save the country, decided to distance themselves from the Arasaka Corporation. In effect, Kei as CEO had destroyed his father's legacy and all that Saburo had built up globally. Kei had not been in Night City at the time of the blast, so at least had survived. But whilst he was aboard his ship, the Sea Viper, he was persuaded that he failed his corporation, his family and himself, and that there was only one way he could restore his family's honor. Kei agreed and that night took his own life by using his own soul killer device. Kei's death restored his honor and also ended the fourth corporate war. Yoronobu decided he should attend Kei's funeral and make peace with his father. Saburo, with encouragement from Hanako, who still cared for her brother, decided eventually to welcome his second son back into the family and the corporation. Whilst it seemed to the Arasaka family that Yoronobu had put his traitorous past behind him, it was all a deception. For despite the Arasaka Corporation being greatly diminished with the fallout from the Fourth Corporate War, they were still not completely destroyed, and with Saburo back as CEO, there was still the potential for the Arasaka Corporation to regain its former power. Yoronobu, therefore, had decided to change his methods of destroying his family's business and realized that it could only be taken down from the inside. 
It would take many years for Yorinobu's plans to come to fruition. By the 2040s, the Arasaka Corporation had split into three rival factions, all vying to become Saburu's next heir and take control of the company. The first was Yorinobu's faction, which he called the Taka, or Hawk faction. Despite Yorinobu disagreeing with his father over how Arasaka should be run, the two were actually very similar, with both being determined to get their way and increasingly covert in their methods. The next faction called the Kiwi or Green Pheasant faction was led by Saburu's daughter, Hanako. She had been working on the Soul Killer device, believing that it had potential as not just a method of assassination, but also to transfer people's consciousness into new clones, allowing them to continue to live. Hanako very much believed in her father's vision, although Saburu was still protective of her more than he had been with his sons, so it's not clear whether she knew the true extent of the Arasaka Corporation's dealings. The third faction was led by Michiko, Kei's secret daughter, and therefore Saburu's granddaughter. After her father's death, Michiko faced deportation to Japan despite being an American citizen. Michiko managed to plead her case to stay in America to President Cress and finished her education. And when her aunt and uncle had established their two factions of the Arasaka Corporation, Michiko was approached by some Arasaka employees to form a third. She had little intention before of having anything to do with her father's family company, but in the end saw the benefits of joining the corporation and infusing it with some of her more Western liberal ideas. Michiko's faction was called the Hato, or Dove faction. While Shironobu, Hanako, and Michiko built up support for their cases to succeed Saburu, the patriarch actually had no intention of stepping down as CEO anytime soon. This was miraculous as by this time he was well over a hundred years old. Saburu was secretly spending a lot of time in med tanks, regenerating his aging body tissue, and had also began investing heavily in bioengineering and mind-preserving technology. Saburu had commissioned Anders Hellman to build something called the Relic Project. Like Hanako, Saburu believed that the Soul Killer device could be turned into a life-preserving device as well. And that's exactly what Relic 1.0 was designed to do. A person can now keep forever preserve their consciousness as an engram that people could interact with. The technology, however, was extremely expensive and therefore the Relic could only be marketed to the top 1% of wealthy people across the world. This caused outrage to most other people who believed that the Relic was a way of the rich to live forever whilst being immune to any actual problems in the world, such as poverty, natural disasters and economic crashes. The Relic wasn't, however, an actual way to becoming truly immortal as it was more of a saved version of a person's personality and didn't have any actual self-awareness or ability to communicate beyond basic conversation. Of course though, Saburu had another version of Relic, Relic 2.0, made in secret just for the Arasaka Corporation's inner sanctum. This version was far more sophisticated as it was able to transfer a person's entire consciousness into another organic body. This could only be achieved after a person's original body had died. The consciousness would be stored and then transferred into the host using nanotechnology. However, initial testing did not go according to plan. Whilst the consciousness could be transferred, it would never really take to its new body, which inevitably led to the failure of the biochip the consciousness was stored on. Nonetheless, Saburo persevered. Meanwhile in America, which was now pretty split into the new USA, NUSA, and the free states that had been gradually separating from the NUSA since the crash of 1996, a unification war was underway. The NUSA wanted to reintegrate the free states back into being one country, but the free states and cities, including Night City, were having none of it. Saburu, and therefore the Arasaka Corporation, decided to publicly back Night City against the incursions of the NUSA. This improved Arasaka's relations with Night City tremendously after what happened with the nuke, and City Councillor Lucius Ryan invited the Arasaka Corporation back to Night City to re-establish their American headquarters there. Arasaka and its army arrived just in time to prevent an attack by NUSA on Night City's Coronado Bay. The NUSA knew that they could not take any more losses as their situation had become unstable, so retreated from the bay and Night City was officially saved. Saburu was welcomed back to Night City and able to build brand new headquarters, but he didn't just stop there. He replaced a lot of the ruins still around from the nuclear fallout of the Fourth Corporate War and built up instead a port with new warehouses, hangars, and autonomous assembly lines. 
Marines. Meanwhile, Yorinobu was still working on his plan to take down the Arasaka Corporation from the inside and was secretly working with the net policing operation Netwatch. Together, they had formulated a plan to retrieve a sample of the Relic Project with a working engram. Whilst Yorinobu was at his father's labs in Tokyo, he seized his opportunity and stole one of the Relic prototypes and specifically chose the engram that contained the consciousness of Johnny Silverhand. However, Anders Hellman was onto what Yorinobu was up to and knew that he had fled to Night City. Anders tipped off Saburu of Yorinobu's betrayal, but also rang Yorinobu and warned him to speak to Saburu before doing anything with the Relic prototype and Netwatch. Saburu then left Tokyo and set sail for Night City with Hanako by his side. She was the only person he trusted with the news of what Yorinobu had done. Yorinobu and Saburu had agreed to meet. Hanako though feared the outcome of the meeting and felt that either she should go instead of Saburu or she should at least accompany her father to help keep the peace between him and her brother. Saburu however insisted that he would meet Yorinobu alone. Hanako asked her father what he intended to do about Yorinobu. It was a question though he could not answer. Saburu met Yorinobu at Yorinobu's suite at the Konbeki Plaza. Unbeknownst to either of them they were not alone either. News of Yorinobu's theft of the relic prototype had spread and become of great interest to others including the mercenaries V and Jackie Wells who on the same night as Saburu's visit to his treacherous son had also snuck into Yorinobu's suite in order to steal the relic prototype for Evelyn Parker, Yorinobu's former lover. Saburu and Yorinobu's meeting quickly went sour and in a fit of rage Yorinobu lunged at his father and strangled him to death. Despite all of the bioengineering and over a century of being a formidable force in the corporate world, Saburu's 158 year life came to an end in just a few short minutes at the hands of his own son. Yonobu knew he couldn't waste any time. It would soon be discovered that his father had died and he had to secure his position as the Arasaka Corporation's CEO in order to continue his plan of destroying the company from the inside. Yonobu staged Saburu's death to look like a poisoning and laid the blame on his father's bodyguard, Takimura. However, what Yonobu didn't know was that V and Jackie Wells had witnessed the whole evening's events and knew the truth of what Yorinobu had done. Yorinobu wasted no time in sabotaging the Arasaka Corporation from the inside by immediately shutting down Arasaka facilities in parts of Japan. But outwardly, Yorinobu had to play the part of the devastated son who had just unexpectedly lost his father, particularly for his sister Hanako's sake. As a family, they, along with Michiko, decided to attend the Dashi Float Parade in Japan Town and used that as an opportunity to deliver a eulogy for Saburu. However, Takimura, the bodyguard, had concocted a plan in order to clear his name and have the truth of Saburu's death be revealed. He had to talk to Hanako and get her to see what was really going on. During that parade, Takimura confronted Hanako and tried to explain that it was Yorinobu that had killed her father. Hanako, though, did not want to believe what Takimura was telling her and wouldn't listen. So Takimura decided that the only way he could convince her of the truth was to abduct her and force her to see who Yorinobu really was. Takimura had little success in convincing Hanako of her brother's guilt until V showed up and as an eyewitness to what really happened was able to convince Hanako of the truth. Before she was able to process this information Arasaka soldiers burst into where Hanako was being held having been sent by Yorinobu to rescue his sister. Hanako was returned to the Arasaka family compound and V managed to escape but Hanako now knew that something had to be done about Yorinobu and that he had to be held responsible for killing their father. Hanako was able to contact V in secret and tasked him with acquiring a copy of Soul Killer. Hanako's plan was to go to Arasaka Tower and find the engram of Saburu and present his engram along with V's testimony to the Arasaka board to convince the board that Yorinobu was guilty of Saburu's murder. The fate of the Arasaka family and corporation was now in the hands of V and whatever they decided to do. If V went with Hanako then Yorinobu would trigger a military coup and have the entire board killed except for Hanako and Michiko. However Hanako still had soldiers that were loyal to her from her faction and together with Takemura would be able to retake Arasaka Towers. Hanako asked V to detain her brother and V eventually found Yorinobu and took the gun Yorinobu had intended to use on himself. Hanako didn't want her brother to be killed and instead decided 
decided to put the interests of the corporation first and transferred Saburu's consciousness into her brother. Saburu was in effect resurrected just in his son's body. This would ensure that once again, the Arasaka Corporation would rise to its former power, its future secure. However, if V decided against joining Hanako and instead teaming up with Pan Am Palmer or her engram friend, Johnny Silverhand, to storm Arasaka Tower in Night City and destroy the Relic Project, they would also go on to release the engram of Alt Cunningham to get her revenge on the Arasaka Tower. This would lead to Hanako's death and Yorinobu leading the Arasaka Corporation into an uncertain future. The other option is that V does none of this at all. With Hanako and Yorinobu's fate unclear, would the Arasaka Corporation survive? Would it ever be remembered as the great power when Saburu was running it at its height? Or would it be forgotten? Sasai and Saburo's legacy destroyed. But for now, this has been the story of the corporation from out east in Tokyo, Japan. This has been the dark tale of the Arasaka Corporation. I want to say a big thank you for watching this video and a huge thank you to my patrons who allow me to make them on a regular basis, including my small fishes, my big fishes, Anthony, Arto, Krem, Greg, and Last Persona user, my YouTube channel Wise Ones, Video Gamer 75, Sith Lord 906, a Frosty Vodka, and One Vata, my Sharks Jason X117, Alfred Correa, and Whale Such Gaming, and my Megalodons Chernobyl Stalker, Hazy Thoughts, Rodacy, and Sinus. But that is all for now. Thank you for watching again. If you want to support this channel, all the links Links are down below where you can get early access and screenshots of my footage collected as well as some merch and if you want more lore videos check out my playlist below and also check out my audio only versions of these episodes on your selected podcast app such as spotify and apple music and if you did enjoy this please do like comment and subscribe to help get them out there and finally with all of that said i shall see you all in the next one cheers